Good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm Philip Worry. I uh, have the great privilege of... Sorry, I faded out. Many hope that happens, Britt, but hopefully not on this occasion. So I'm the Associate Provost with Responsibility for the Arts here at MIT, and it, it is a double privilege, really, to welcome back Olafur Eliasson to MIT. He will be here and up here in a moment to talk with us. Uh, and he just reminded himself and me as we were chatting, if I may, Olafur, that this may be your sixth lecture at MIT over the years. So I'd like to think he's part of our family, and I encourage him to think that of himself. And I'll come to the good reason why he's part of this family. There are at least a couple of excellent ones. So we're also here to dedicate afterwards his masterful installation at the MIT Nano, our newest building, and quite a magnificent building. And you'll see this uh, after this event, after his lecture. And it's called Northwest Passage. And I think you'll find it as moving as I do. That's uh, building 12, for you who know the numbers. Uh, let me say just a word about the Percent for Art program here at MIT. It's the cornerstone of our public art collection. Without the Percent for Art program, we wouldn't have Olafur Eliasson's art displayed here. We wouldn't have dozens of other remarkable pieces of work, art installations across this campus. So it, it is just a vital program. Uh, that collection contains, by the way, some 70 works today, and it is increasing, maybe not by leaps and bounds, it's hard to do that, but it is growing, and it will grow quite quickly in the next few years, I learned just today. Um, the List Visual Arts Center is responsible for the Percent for Art program. It is responsible for the public art collection, and it is Paul Ha, the director of the List Visual Arts Center, who leads those efforts for MIT, and he does it so admirably. Um, the, yes, good. So the Percent for Art program uh, was established many decades ago, 50 years ago, in fact, um, and it allocates now up to $500,000 for an art project to be associated with any major new facility MIT builds or rehabs, okay? It has to be significant, but it's hard today to imagine buildings that aren't, uh, at least on this campus, as some of you know all too well. Uh, the policy, as I said, is 50 years old, established in 1968, but there were earlier collaborations uh, between artists and architects on this campus before we formalize things. Last year, two stunning percent uh, for art commissions were uh, established, went up. One is Olafur's and the other is by Nick Mouse. They were completed and added to our collection. And I want to mention and thank the principal donors to the Eliasson project. And just take me a second. MIT itself, which provides the base funding that I just referred to, Robert Sanders, class of 64, and Sarah Ann Sanders, who have been long, long time supporters of our public art collection and this Percent for Art program. Fotin Demoulis and Tom Cote, whom I'm told are here today, uh, and we thank you very much. Uh, the David Berment Foundation, donors to the 2014 McDermott Award Gala, also contributed, and the Council for the Arts at MIT, which is the sponsor of the McDermott Award here. Uh, let me just say a little about Olafur, and it will only be a little. It's hard to describe him uh, briefly, but he is the individual we're celebrating today. He lives and works in Copenhagen and in Berlin. Uh, he has a remarkable studio in Berlin, dozens and dozens of individuals who work with him at his studio, creating art and doing much more than that. Um, gallery settings there. The, his practice in great, engages a very broad sphere 
uh, through architectural projects and interventions in civic space. He founded his studio in 1995, and he expanded and leveraged it to, into a multidisciplinary conceptual, conceptualizing uh, organization and pl really planning the future of what he and his colleagues wish to create. Members in that studio include craftsmen, specialized technicians, architects, archivists, administrators, programmers, art historians, and cooks. And he makes it happen with his colleagues. And my colleagues who have visited that studio come back swoony about the forces of creativity that they observe in their brief visits there. I said he's no stranger to MIT. In 2014, he was awarded MIT's most prestigious arts award, the Eugene McDermott Award in the Arts. Um, and he was awarded that for recognition of his influential art practice and its broader significance to the public sphere. His visit and residency in 2014 here were an enormous success, appreciated by faculty, students, staff, and the wider community who had the privilege of getting to know him and hear him. Uh, we were also very taken by his solar light-based project, Little Sun. Um, it's one of his philanthropies, and it is bringing light, literally bringing light, inexpensive light, to parts of sub-Saharan Africa and elsewhere that have no electricity. And he spends a great deal of time in Ethiopia. In fact, he teaches at the university in Addis Ababa and has been there for a while. The McDermott Award is now in its 45th year. Eugene McDermott and his wife, Margaret, alas, both gone, were founders and the first patrons of MIT's public art collection back in the 1960s. Today, that collection ranks, and I can say this, I know I'm at MIT, may not sound modest, but it ranks among, if not the top public art collection at a on a university campus in this country. And we are tremendously proud, Paul, of that collection, which you and others before you have helped to you know, further and develop. And, and I hope you all have a chance to tour sometime what we do. But Oliver, it's your show. Welcome back, your home. Thank you for being with us, really. And congratulations. So thank you so much. Thank you, Philip. And thank you for having me back here. Um, let's just put this in my pocket. Exciting to see so many of you again. Last time I was here, it was celebratory. And I was, in fact, um, in the great company of Mrs. McDermott, who I understand has passed away since I was here last. So I thought I should start by sending my blessings to her path, a good journey from, from here on, and, and I remember her daughter was there. Was, I couldn't hear so well what Mrs. McDermott, the older, was saying. Margaret, what's her name, right? Uh, Margaret. <laughs> she leaned over to her daughter and said, I like this guy. He's like us. And I said, what do you mean by us? He puts on his trousers one leg at a time, she said. <laughs> That's true. It's not actually uh, how I necessarily see myself, as you will find out, but, but it was sweet that she uh, gave me that memory, and I often used it. And in Europe, uh, that doesn't always um, translate into a very, a very, a very strong punchline, but I think of Mrs. McDermott with love, and her daughter gave me another sentence. Now, I have, now I'm sort of, uh, um, sort of sharing a few um, jokes. I thought uh, the daughter left me another one. I've used that very often as well. This person is all hat and trousers and no horse. And this, of course, in Europe makes no sense at all. Uh, but I guess um, but it's fun to say uh, nevertheless. So I had a great time here with the McDermott's. And, 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 and honest, quite honestly, it was a really fantastic moment. So I celebrate you for having had this long relationship uh, with them. And, and, and by all means, when I started gymnasium, uh, well, eighth, seventh or eighth grade, I actually had a Texas instrument as I said, as I believe I said then and so on. So it was very touching all in all. Nevertheless, so here I am today to, uh, to be with you. 
And as you just mentioned, I've been coming really for quite some years. I've had lovely um, relationships, some of which have been ongoing. I worked again and again with Caroline Jones. I was here when uh, Uta Mesa Bauer was here we were at the art school with Rene Green. Even before that, for a small architectural project, I, I came back on a number of occasions and the McDermott, McDermott situation and around Lillison was, of course, wonderful and incredibly well hosted by Lila McKinney, who I hope is, is here. Lila, are you actually here? Oh, there you are, love. Good to see you again. So, so it's been very exciting, and obviously when this opportunity to actually do a work of art here on campus came, I, I could not be more happy, even though we have been working on it for seven years, which for my standards is, is very um, a long time, uh, but I understand here it is not quite, um, quite that long, and, and uh, so that thing with the trousers and taking on the trousers and all of that <laughs> somehow made sense. And in the course of that, I briefly met Vladimir. Is, are you here, Vladimir? Oh, there you are, Vladimir. <laughs> haven't changed a bit over those seven years. So that's lovely too. No, so I obviously do feel, uh, in fact, uh, uh, that I'm, you know, if not family, then you know, extended family, uh, I was, as I would say. So I brought a few of my slides uh, just to give you or provide you some context. And uh, I tried to pick a bit of uh, work that somewhat resonated with the, with the work that some of us, should you not be too cold afterwards to walk over, uh, unless it's something where, where you have to be invited to, but I suggest you all just pop over and see it afterwards, and then I think we might actually have a few questions over there and some hot cocoa. Um, right, okay? So, I can get started. Yeah, Paul is doing like this, so, okay, <laughs> I get it, Paul. Um, anyway, um, first slide. Should we lower the light a little bit? And I, I obviously I realize I can walk around, right? so I can see it. So one of my very first works um, included drizzling a little bit of water uh, from the ceiling and then having a you know light on it, a spotlight. In fact, and as you all know, this is actually what I said last time uh, on on my lecture last time. So I hope you bear with me. Uh, when you look at a water drop which also has water on it, you see. Uh, the spectral colors depending on the angle, right? So when the drop is up here, it's sort of bluish, down here sort of red and, and so on. It's also what creates a rainbow and all of that. And it's interesting to think about the fact that the, that the, the, the colors obviously is depending on the triangulation between the lamp, the drop, and the eye. And if there's no eye, one could argue, there's obviously also no color because the angle is not there. And, and in that sense, it's also interesting to think that if Philip is standing over here and I'm over here, the angle for him is different, so he sees a different rainbow, right? So even though we're in the same room, and we're sharing the room, and we have a collective or a shared experience, it is by definition a different and his own rainbow. And one could even argue that it is not necessarily the eye that is taking in the color, right? So that from the light to the drop to the eye, one could also argue that, well, it is the, light, the eye that is looking at the drop, and therefore the color is there. Right? So one could reverse the subject or the object or even negotiate whether the eye is actually a consumer and maybe argue the eye is in fact a producer of the rainbow. So that's a, sort of a nice concept to say, suggest that should you get involved with art or sort of take upon yourself to go into a sort of a artistic situation, uh, let's not define it, define it further. Now you might, instead of seeing it as an opportunity for you to take in or consume or sort of take with you art. It's also an opportunity for you to sort of create or produce or become the person who actually co-writes the narrative. I mean, I would like as an artist to have a little bit of the narrative on my side, of course, having created the setup with the drop and all of that. But the nice idea, I think, is the hospitality or the generosity in, in, in fact, allowing people to explore the fact that they own what it is they see. Now it's just a question, do people actually feel that they own it, right? But I think it's fair to claim that art always has hosted the opportunity for you to take the ownership of the experience and maybe define the narrative or create the narrative or create the situation, if you want, that you, in fact, are producing. The reason why I start by this is because I think it's an interesting um, it's an interesting uh, uh, opportunity as we are in a situation where a lot of people see themselves as the end of a line of sort of information, right? So information very often is regarded, well, there's some sort of source at the beginning, whether 
a large uh, sort of, uh, let's say, Facebook or some kind of huge uh, network source, or just like a small narrative source, and you become then the receiver, and the receiver is obviously the last one at the end, and, and, and maybe also often considered the most passive one, right? And of course, being the producer seems to suggest that you being the one who's receiving, not as a consumer, but as a producer, makes you more active. And suddenly being active means that you also have well, at least some responsibility to write. And this is interesting because once you suddenly seem to suggest that we, the people who look at the world, are in fact responsible for what we are seeing, that just changes the narrative of like who actually are the agent, who has the agency or who has the affordance in, in, in terms of defining, well, what is my reality? How do I constitute what is real for me? And I'm very much aware of that we have plenty of situations and people and so on and so forth who are deprived from the sort of opportunity to actually say, this is my reality and I own it and I'm going to do what I want to do and so on and so forth. But nevertheless, the notion or the idea, especially within art, that you are in fact in a situation where you can claim to be right in what you see, I think has a very strong potential. And that means it also allows you to sort of revisit a very established narrative, like, for instance, a historical narrative on what was the history of a certain situation. You can go back and modify that and change that accordingly, right? So this is, I think, one of the things that is going on in art right now. You're rewriting a lot of things that had been written in stone, and it, by t shifting the narrative, you realize it's not quite as stony as you think. It is, in fact, more relative. And once you actually start, sort of start engaging, you realize, well, my engagement has consequences, meaning that if you start debating things, things loosen up and you can introduce an alternative narrative and an alternative reality and so on and so forth. Right, so this was sort of an idea that I think that there, that there is a great opportunity in not just in actual work of art, but also the way that art offers you the opportunity to also become a person in the world. Of course, this is a bigger topic and something one can talk about a long time. I just want to see if I, when I shift here, it shifts there. Uh, Obviously, what I have on this screen is uh, apparently a completely different uh, slideshow. Could we change so I can see, the, so that I have the same uh, slides on this as here? Who, who, whoever was uh, in charge. Oh, thank you, Lord. No, so, so, so this thing about the rainbow, water, rainbow, easy, right? I, ha I had that rainbow you saw before, this one. It's a circle, right? So you walk in. You actually have to go through the water. There's not a lot of water. So you get a little wet, you look in, and you see, if I move around, the rainbow will move with me. And you sort of start a little dance with rainbows. And what one could argue is obviously the body, the moving around, the kind of spatial opportunity that a space then becomes, like a circular space in this way, so a circular space like a Roman forum, if you want. So they took this notion of, well, how do we move? Uh, maybe I have to be closer if I click here. So uh, be, until we sort out how I sw switch the slide, because we, we obviously we are obsessed with the fact that looking at art, as it also sounds like looking, is something we do with our eyes. But as you can see here, we could also introduce the notion, maybe the seeing is actually not an, a sort of a... a, sort of a Okay, like an ocular activity. Maybe seeing is not just a cognitive act. Maybe seeing is, in fact, a physical thing. So if you, in this round glass tunnel, which is called your rainbow panorama, want to change the color, you walk. So that means your physical activity is what changes the color. One could say downstairs in this particular museum in Aarhus, Aarhus in Aarhus in Denmark, uh, um, downstairs there's this, uh, the Golden Age paintings from, from the Den Denmark, 18... 60 to 1880, famous collection. And there's that idea that the gap between the paintings is empty and the painting is the narrative, right? And maybe having gone through this, you realize that it is maybe the sequence and the spaces between the paintings, just like spaces between words, that actually is what writes the narrative once you walk through the museum. So also museology and the way the chronology and narratives are presented to us is actually up for grasp once you introduce the fact that you, once you walk through the exhibition, walk through the museum, are in fact a co-producer or co-writer. Don't throw out, I'm not saying don't de-professionalize, don't throw out the curator, don't take the science away, 
but do not dismiss, dismiss or dimish, diminish your own role in that sort of experience. Having said that, this sits on the top of a museum. As you can see, it's, it is in fact like a kind of proposal for a rainbow where you can walk around uh, and, and so on and so forth. But it is also a lovely opportunity for finally uh, letting the kids loose, for instance, like the small children run around, be loud, and, 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 and to a large extent also to examine whether the grown-ups are going to be okay with that and have that whole situation where there's nothing much that they can ruin, so maybe it's okay. Suddenly you have some grown-ups going up, your kids are not behaving. Then they go like, so what is behaving? So that's interesting, right? So what's the right? <laughs> and and they, no, I'm not saying, and, and, and I'm quite serious because obviously we are looking for the small pockets in our societies where that debate can actually take place without people polarizing each other. Because very quickly, if this was going to happen in a let's say in the British Parliament, it would become an argument immediately with very dogmatic and sort of stuck. And, and, and where in our societies are these tiny small pockets in public space, in the Agora, where we can actually share the situation, disagree, negotiate, sometimes agree, and then not, and, and so on and so forth. Right? So I, what I'm trying to get at is that on a very basic level, I'm, I'm very curious about the fact that there are spaces within what we call the wider cultural sector where we can actually explore the very simple things of how do we share an opportunity. <coughs> I worked with this notion of larger shared spaces for a while. This was one of the very first time I was um, uh, lucky to kind of get more involved with this. This is the Tate Modern uh, in 2000 and what is that, three or four, I think three? <coughs> Three or four, but anyway. So, and the and and the, the turbine hall, which at the time had only just been introduced to to art, the building was renovated by Herzog Dumeron, and and it, it was sort of free of free entrance, and and you could argue that that part of the building, that being the sort of entrance lobby to the museum, was both public. I mean, both a part of the street outside, and, and also part of the museum on the inside, of course. So, in that sense, it it, it I thought was sort of on a hinge between being either a part of the city or a part of the museum. I think since then, this museum have made it more a part of a museum uh, for various reasons. And, and, but the opportunity here for me was to, see, was to sort of experiment, could I create a public space in which what we want to have act, uh, going on in the public, in fact, took, took, space, took place. So, a number of different things can be said about the piece, but if we are now talking today about, you know, how do we share space? What is a public space? What does, what does it mean to actually be in, 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 a, in a space together and acknowledge that people have very diverse ideas about it and still you are sort of co-producing it together? In this case, I was curious about that people um, seem to think that sharing it amplified the quality of the actual space. I mean, normally we in art in particular have this idea of that, oh, I wish I was alone in this museum, because then it would be really nice. And, and obviously maybe there is an opportunity to sort of revisit art history's obsession with aloneness. If you think about art history, it's been to a large extent written as if you were ever alone, always alone, looking at a painting. For obvious reasons, because it was a very subjective sort of narrative and so on. But interestingly, it never really was a big topic in our history that you are always 25 people in front of Mona Lisa, right? Always, right? And and to what extent does that obviously, obviously that influences the experience of the Mona Lisa? And I can see why in art history that's not necessarily the scientific main court. But but interestingly, I think that the museums offers an opportunity to also write scientific or have scientific scientific focus on the fact that. These spaces are spaces of shared opportunities. It's very complex, I get that, but point, point here is that at the, at the Weather Project, I, I think, and, and this was before social media and before um, the ways things just are communicated today, it was a lovely opportunity where the, the idea of the word of mouth and then the notion of the physical presence actually became a big issue. The physical presence, I, I sometimes show, show, a film, show a little film, which I don't have with me today, where people are, in fact, laying on the floor. Then there is a mirror in the ceiling, and they're looking for themselves in the mirror. And once they have detected themselves in the mirror, they start to behave in a way which is, one could argue, 
out of sync with what is how, what is the sort of definition of normality within our sort of cultural institutions, right? So they start to do all kinds of things. And the point here is obviously not necessarily what they do is out or out of sync. It is that all the other things that one normally does is suddenly also being exposed. Because suddenly when you walked up and show the Donald George show on the third floor at the same time, it's a lovely exhibition, you suddenly realize that everybody were not moving very much. So the so activities on the floor also made explicit how little physical activity we are, even though Donald Judd himself spoke about the body, the length of the arm, how long is the arm, and the space and the architecture of that, right? But it had little body, it had a very little body in it. Maybe because the way Donald Judd was also presented in art history was very disembodied, disregarding, or even though it was actually very sort of physically uh, and vividly described, but it was not about physical activity. Some people might be bashing me for having said that, but, but, but interestingly, uh, also, you could also say that the museum machine, and I say it because I think there is a comment here also to public space, once people then up in the Donald Judd show started sitting down on the floor looking at the Donald Judd, which is very comfortable, it's a good thing to do when you look at Donald Judd to sit on the floor, the guard would come over and say, you're not supposed to sit on the floor. This is a Donald Judd show. You can, if you want to sit on the floor, you can go down to for a show. And, and in that sense, no, and it's just, it just presented that there, is, there are, of course, all the time and, 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 and constantly rules that are not verbalized, non-existent, but they're always there. And of course, these rules are to some sometimes, because I don't want to just simplify too much, obviously sometimes they are uh, practical because they kind of create a, a social opportunity for uh, bringing us closer, but they also are, often are, in fact, limitations and take away the opportunity to explore things and negotiate things in ways that might, in fact, take us further into other solutions. See, now, these, the, these questions of uh, public space and, and who uh, and how do we perceive the space is something that I've been uh, working with uh, on and off. Um, I think it's fair to say that when we think about public space, it's clear that there are different traditions in different parts of the world, and the notion public uh, of course, uh, stems from also a different tradition in, in to what extent humanistic values, you could say, are in fact brought into the urban practice and how that urban practice had been taken on onto a sort of a, should I say, a public uh, domain. And you have different, uh, so in London, as I understand it, there was in, uh, there was in, in, uh, in um, so I might be a little off here, but I believe like 20 years ago, there was like 75 architects working in the public sector department of city planning in London, and today there's two. And, and, and one could call that this sort of shift in strategy there is to suggest that there is that, that, that the kind of public agenda in public space, the handling of public space, has been given over to the private sector. So the private sector, to the large extent, has taken over, should I say, the, the, the handling because whatever was left of public was sold, and the little bit of parks and green areas in London are already uh, museologized into sort of more heritage departments, so it's not really things that are negotiated like this. And now I'm up for bashing again, I can tell. But, and obviously America has had that similar uh, tradition. It was never really a big pub. There has never been a strong public uh, sort of uh, tradition for, for what is in North, uh, in Scandinavia, where I grew up, the sort of idea of the public space. Here you had space, which did not belong to anybody. And then, of course, the white Americans came, killed everybody else who actually did own the space or sort of had, had the rights to it at least. And then they took what was said, so the idea of privatization and the idea of the passes and so on. And this has been a well-written history. And of course, a few people actually brought some sophistication into that, like John Dewey and, and, and the sort of American phenomenology approach that there is a very strong sense of a social and a shared space. So I'm not saying this is not the case, but the point is here still, how do we maintain a public space in which we are, in fact, able to share things outside of the private realm. So when I work with space, I very often generalize a lot by saying, okay, so what we have, we have a civic society, right? the great civic society. In the civic society, we have what is that we also call the private sector, and the private sector is different depending on where we are in the world, but then we have, of course, also the so-called public sector. The public sector is the government, the public parks, the parks, and the, sort of the cemeteries sometimes also. In America, the cemeteries are often very private also. 
And then, of course, you have different sectors that you have also in America, an amazing philanthropic sector. They're not very strong in Europe. There's a big one there as well. But the philanthropic sector in America is very active and so on. So, so depending on where we are, we have these resources. Then, of course, we have an interesting one, which is called the cultural sector. That's very interesting because the cultural sector is, in fact, decentralized. It's messy. It's complicated. <laughs> But it, hasn't, it, it doesn't have a sort of authoritarian system. The, the cultural sector, let's just say, well, who is that then? Well, obviously, I think it's the artist. But it's a lot more. It's all the sort of the dance, the music, all, all the cultural things, literature, everything. Then it's all the museums, the theaters, the ballet houses, all these things. And, and then it's all the people that work in that, right? So for every one author who writes a book, even though, even including the book who are not is published, apparently that creates 2.7 jobs. So the cultural sector actually, interestingly, has more employment than the car industry. If you go into and, and you have, you know, nowadays all this is measured and so on, how much money is return on value and so on on cultural sector. My point here is without diving into something I'm not really specialized in, is to tell you, well, the cultural sector is actually a robust civic societal machine which employs tons of people, has a huge economy, mixed between private philanthropic and public money, it's an enormous industry which creates a lot of stability in society. It's just to suggest I, as an artist, or us as a culture, to the extent that you are involved with the culture sector, we are not at the periphery of civic society, where the kind of modern mechanics, the economy and jobs and all of that is just at the center and the culture is at the periphery. The culture is very much at the center of society and so on and so forth, right? This one can talk about, but it's interesting to see to, 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 in a world where polarization, uh, sort of popul populism, uh, general sort of, uh, uh, how should I say, decay of trust, like falling apart, the things that are, are, are if, if, if that is what we are seeing, uh, suddenly we could look for, well, who is in fact, act, who is acting inclusive, who is acting hospitable, who are, in fact, more listening than being propagandistically talking. And if you look through civic society, I would say, well, that is the cultural sector, right? Of course, there's more people. I would say, I, today is fair to say the university, right? the educational sectors, and so on. So I can see that it's complex. But you, you see what I'm getting at. I think the cultural sector has the potential. And I don't mean me necessarily as an artist. I kind of also do. But you know, I, I, I think that if we look at as the, at the kind of larger structure of the culture sector, we have a lot to offer. Right? We just also need to make it available and put, stop being sort of obsessed with romanticizing our comfortable position at the periphery, claiming that out here the truth is that we own, we own uh, this space out here. We need to get into the center and say that we actually know to offer something to the center of society. Maybe leaving this periphery center to, uh, narrative altogether might be productive. So, this is an old project I did. In, this is actually in Sweden. I did it in various places. I also did it in Los Angeles because, of course, the city of water in Los Angeles and, and all of that. So it's a bit of dye. It's environmentally uh, not uh, damaging dye. Uh, uh, it comes in a few different colors. The green one, um, as you can see here. I only did the Green River project. I realized later that this is, in fact, what St. Patrick's Day is in Chicago also used. So, so, so in Chicago, of course, it just means St. Patrick's Day, except on if it's not St. Patrick's Day, it's a green river. So, so, and, 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 and in, in, it's a kind of intervention, and in this case in Stockholm, it was not presented as an artwork. So it obviously has a sort of this idea of a, uh, you can sort of activistic things, throwing it into water and running, running away. Um, it's funny how doing stuff like that has changed since I did. This was in, I think, 2001, and obviously having uh, had a number of, for instance, uh, terror attacks, uh, the perception of these large interventions, because it does look you know, toxic, it looks brutal, right? At that point, and maybe we were just at the very back end of a golden age, people looked up and said, my God, that's really stunning. It's really beautiful. It's like a watercolor of some sort, and so on. And, and, uh, and obviously, some people say, oh, this is really horrible, and, 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 and so on and so forth. And, and actually, in the Swedish paper the next day, they, they, the police could calm down. People say there was a leak in the heating system of the government. The government is the very building. And I thought it was fun to do it by the government. It's like government in Sweden, particularly, being the sort of the reality machine of, of, of Northern Europe um, and, and all of that. And then the day after, again, uh, they had found out it was, in fact, an artist who was trying to do an art intervention. Uh, and, and all of that. Um, 
As to an architectural discourse, one could argue also interestingly, I think, Stockholm is an amazing city. It's like so beautiful. And one of the great things about the city is, of course, that it is, it is as you would say in Italy, it's picobello, right? It's so clean. It has no problems, but right? nothing, nothing goes wrong. I mean, now Sweden is struggling a bit, but all in all, it's like, it kind of looks like a museum. You come to Stockholm, it's like traveling 100 years back. Nothing has changed. There's no dirt. Everything's happy. Everybody's happy also, and all of that. <laughs> so, so, so it looks a little bit like a postcard. So you walk into, if you go back to what I said about the body and about you being able to claim the space and say, this is me, I am actually going to produce the space. This is like walking into a museum. The museum totally owns the narrative, right? Reality is defined. You don't need to think. Just come and enjoy. It's an interesting idea. And, uh, and one could then claim, well, this is just a representation. It's an idealized version of the good society, and so on and so forth. And let's give it to the Swedes. They've been very good at it. And I, I love Sweden, so it's, this is not the point here. But the point is, it's dangerous to maintain this museum in which reality becomes totally non-negotiable, and you just become like, well, disconnected, not listened to which is then obviously what goes on, not just, not just in Sweden, but in many cities. So if you throw in a bit of green dye in a river like that, what happens is, of course, the representation of a beautiful city disappears. You know, you could also argue, if you go to Legoland in Denmark, I say it because you all work with Lego. I'm afraid I said that last time, too. Oh, my God, it's so boring. Legoland, Denmark. Lego, you know Lego bricks? You are great friends with Lego because they, and, and the, and the, um, and the, um, What's it called? The uh, Media Lab. And Lego has. And I love Lego. Mini Stock, Lego Stockholm. Okay? So you go to Lego Stockholm, Lego Labs, and you go, this is Lego Stockholm. And it is not trying to pretend not to be Lego because it's only this house, this, this tall, right? And you know what you get? It's Lego. So there's, it's totally honest. You could say, I mean, now uh, you, know, you don't say transparent anymore nowadays, but you can see what you get, right? You get it, right? But when you go to Stockholm, it's trying to be a city 100 years ago. So it's like, it's like fake. It's a little unfair. But, it, it, you know, it's like trying to be something else than it is because it's like the values are, in fact, stuck and disin disintegrating from it. So the Green River was to show well, how does reality actually look? So suddenly it was not a representation. It was not a postcard of something a long time ago. It was not a set of values that are stock and dogmatic. It was, in fact, a space in which we can live and breathe and negotiate and own our own position in the space. See, now, this is, more a, dis this is a discourse that is more about, I think, an urban discourse, like how do we prevent the postcard to take over or the rendering of our reality to take over our space. And this, of course, was one of the topics that I was discussing with Mayor Bloomberg at the time in Bloomberg. How do you prevent the, the skyline and the whole narrative of New York becoming the commodity? Well, how do you claim back the fact that space is, that has depth and space is something in we occupy and we stay in together? Space is something in which you need to nurture the public, you need to nurture the Agora, you need to nurture the forum, you need to nurture the sort of place where people can meet and so on and so forth. And as much as we love New York, we also know that New York, like many other cities, has gone through various degrees of, of uh, rather ruthless privatization, which has taken away a lot of opportunities with regards to what can a, space, a city space actually offer people. And in a world where we see, uh, together with the artificial intelligence and all the robots and all the things that are going on, where people are probably going to end up having a lot more free time, especially the, the younger one in the room, they're going to grow up in a situation where they only have to work 30% of the week and the rest they don't have anything to do. And that's why it's very important that a city has room for the 70% where they're not going to be working, right? And not every city, like, like here in Boston, has a major green necklace rod running right through where everybody can do everything. And of course, there is the Central Park, and there's a bit of space here and there and so on. But, but nevertheless, this is how I talked to Mayor Bloomberg. And obviously, he uh, came at it from a different angle, but very generously, he supported it and went right behind it and, and obviously saw the potential of re reactivating the periphery of, of, of Manhattan, which at the time had still been underdeveloped. So, so I, I understand the complexity of what I'm saying. But nevertheless, if we just hold on to the narrative of the waterfall, if you think about it, so I, being interested in nature, and there's that lovely discussion about what 
spatial opportunities nature actually offers us. The waterfall is very simple. If you look at a landscape, especially a beautiful one like Iceland, I saw, uh, where I recommend you all to go uh, and check that out. So there's no trees in Iceland. So that means you look at you look at the landscape and say, oh my God, well, besides it being beautiful, it's quite odd that there's no tree because then I do not know how large is the landscape, right? There's no scaling and you wonder, is it gonna take me two hours or two days to walk to that mountain over there? And, and, and which is fascinating because it's not really about the landscape, it is you are struggling with synchronizing your body, your physical, so you're trying to find out, is this, or even better, if you go to Greenland, you just look, is it, is it two days or is it two weeks? Am I, what, what? And, and of course, as a child, when you come to New York, you go like, okay, for me, it was the same thing. But a waterfall, then you realize if waterfall is very slow, it's a big waterfall far away. If it falls very fast, it's a small waterfall closer by. It's very simple. Everybody subconsciously know this somehow. And you look and say, oh, that's a waterfall. Oh, it's about two hours. So the waterfall, I can see it. Of course, you can also just start to move and you realize, oh, this rock comes closer, this mountain moves over there, oh, that means it's a small mountain, not so far away. So if you actually, if you actually walk, seeing with your legs, you, are, you can take the space and you can sort of become spatially productive if you, want, if you want. So I said that to Mayor Bloomberg, let's give space back to Manhattan, let's unpostcard it, let's not make it a representation, let's not render the city, let's not let the real estate language take over the documentation of the city. Let's take the city back to the people. Let's be civic and, and create the public and the forum and Agora. And as you know, in the course of the, his uh, role as a mayor, Mike actually got more and more in, involved with, with, in fact, the notion of, of uh, uh, recreational spaces. And of course, within the framework of, of an American city, he had a different way of verbalizing, but quite honestly, he became very committed to to uh, the fact that a space is, in fact, a, more, uh, a public space is the more productive space to people of various backgrounds to be more likely to come up with a shared sense of space than having to meet in an orchestra or in a sort of semi-private or, or in a different space. So he, I think, uh, and I have still maintained a relationship on such discussions uh, and, 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 um, and so on. Oh, and this I won't talk about. Oh, did I just make two jumps here? I think, okay. So this is just a small bridge in Copenhagen. Uh, and it's just to sort of come with an example of what I'm talking about. So I occasionally get to work in actual public space with actual public sector and politicians and so on and so forth. So this was an attempt to create a bridge. So instead of just connecting the two sides, was to su suggest that the sort of the gap between the chairs, so to speak, the bridge itself was a little handful of public spaces, so it's small, like small spaces, and then it's also the entrance to the small sailboat harbor, so the bridge sort of swings up, like you can see in the upper right corner, it sort of swings to the side, but then people can sit there um, in the inner harbor in Copenhagen, and, and so on and so forth. So, um, I'll just take a sip of the water. How are we doing on time? This is an MIT list bottle, <laughs> so, so yeah, you clearly you need like some kind of major edu like long education to open this. Oh, you just turn it. <laughs> oh my God, like, that's so funny. Anyway, I'm still here. So, um, so I thought, um, see, you see, now I try to uh, present you. Uh, a few um, sort of arguments about the potential of the cultural sector, but also the potential of the shared space or the public space. And, and uh, I wanted to say something about the fact that campuses in universities, to a large extent and for a long time, were considered the con connection routes, and that's why every lawn always have like five or six routes. And the notion of uh, actually uh, creating this sort of Outdoor parliaments uh, has not been um, 
necessarily fully utilitarized because the efficiency of American universities, in particularly where the campuses are often quite amazing, the efficiency has been a driver because obviously they're paying a lot of money to go to school and therefore standing outside the university and debating with the other people is not necessarily what people have been paying for. Um, but, but, but nevertheless, uh, I, of course, I'm very excited about the fact that there are so many artworks here on, on campus and this notion of this space actually being worthwhile addressing, I think is, is something worth pursuing. Um, and therefore, I was quite excited about the, the building when um, I was uh, invited to, to consider this. And, and when we talked about it, I looked at it. And, and, uh, and besides this being a very prominent uh, piece of science and, and likely to actually impact uh, our future uh, a lot, as a lot of the other buildings and the, in, and the, the what goes on there it will as well. But this, this being one narrative, and, and the notion uh, of new routes, uh, um, I thought that was interesting. And then this whole idea that there is a kind of semi-utilitarian necessity to be able to go from the front to the back through this corridor. So the corridor actually uh, is not, you could call it like very prominent, it's actually a little more practical. So I was quite happy to be in a space where, which both had a function, or sort of almost utilitarian a route to it, a functional thing, and also it had the prominence of being at, at the very entrance of this very uh, particular building. Um, at the time, I was um, studying, um, so because now this is already then, I believe, five or six or seven years ago when we started talking about this, I was interested in the fact that in 2007, the Northwest Passage had, uh, for the first time, been sailed without an icebreaker. Uh, at the same time, uh, 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 the western part of this South Pole had started fracturing at a higher rate. And, and generally, there, were, there had been more and more sort of ice floating around. Uh, uh, um, and, and as we had seen on satellite photos, I was just curious about this. So without any very strong relationship to the nanotechnology, I was just interested in the fact that climate and and, uh, and, and the shape of the planet were in fact changing and new routes were opening. Um, and, and this is how it sort of came about. I had worked with this uh, notion of having mirrors in the ceilings as you saw it in the Tate show a long time ago already, but I worked with it and this idea that when you look up and you see a mirror, what you see is of course not the mirror, but what is in the mirror, namely the floor. So in a sense, you are looking up to something somewhat similar to a fractured sky, if you want, like a a uh, uh, sky uh, broken into pieces. And what you see in the sky is, in fact, the ground, very ground you're walking on. So one could say that you can actually see the fact that you are likely to be in a situation soon where you have to jump from one mirror. Uh, do you see what I'm saying? Jump from one mirror to the next in order to make it um, uh, into the courtyard, if you want. So uh, if that all that ice melts, like Northwest Passage and South Pole, uh, I'm not quite sure how Boston is, but I, I'm, if I'm not wrong, Boston is pretty low because we have water anyway everywhere. So I just thought the fact that uh, what uh, the fact that these could also be stepping stones are likely to be uh, one of our future scenarios because I think we are moving um, from a scenario where we are going to find out how to prevent the water coming and flooding us to trying to find out how do we design how do we design to quote Paolo Antonelli from, from MoMA, who's doing the design biennale in, in Milan right now, how do we design a graceful departure for humankind on Earth? Or well, how do we make really nice stepping stones so we don't get wet feet? It's a scary narrative. I was just at an event with, with Hadil, in, indeed, where Paolo Antonelli, for the first time in my life, made a presentation of a design. And I was just struck by it, where she talked about how do we, dis how do we design the departure of humankind on planet in the most not ruining way for the planet. How do we get out of here without ruining for the people who, or for the animals or the plants and also? Intense, huh? That's pretty intense, huh? <laughs> oh, So anyway, so I thought I'm not trying to be um, gloomy suddenly here on this artwork, but I was just, it just struck me that only two weeks ago, this was the first time that that narrative was presented to me as a serious design discussion. So, so the whole um, notion here is, of course, that what we see up in the um, what we see up in the mirrors are, in fact, semicircles. This means that it's a it's a 
U profile with LED in it, uh, to, to be frank. The yellow color, as, as some of you who've been in the building might have noticed, is quite similar to the one in the so-called bacteria-free zones. And I was just wondering whether that yellow color is just to tell people now, or does it actually kill bacteria, Vladimir? Does the color sort of... A yeah, UVA, so it doesn't actually, it's not like a germ, uh, germ killing color. But anyway, so, so here, as you can tell, it's, it's a semicircle under the mirror. Um, and uh, it was fun to hear some, a, few, a few of the students I spoke to, they said they first thought it was actually circles. But what it asks you to of, is, of course, the fact that even though your brain would very much like to complete this image and pre present to you the, the perfect narrative of the right circle sitting up there, maybe in a hole in the ceiling, it is, in fact, only a half circle. And, and, and once you make a little effort, you obviously will quickly realize that you're only looking at half a circle. And, and one could propose that it's maybe the sun uh, and the heat of the sun being one of the reasons for our um, sort of melting of the ice. But the other one is, is also just simple geometric shape, like the, the sort of the plates or the, if you want, the ice sheets, they are, they are somewhat um, um, random uh, in shapes. And the circles are, of course, a strong geometric uh, shape and so on. And, and um, as you walked through, I was curious to see that there are reflections from the inside and the outside. And I stood there for a while, and there was a bicycle coming against me. And it was nice to see the bicycle sort of boop, 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 up through the mirror. So, and, 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 uh, and the bicycle, um, once it approached me, uh, went slower and looked at me. Why is this person looking up and not at me? And then the, <laughs> and the bicycle also looked up. I was like, sorry, oh, no. Uh, but uh, I'm just saying, it's, uh, so, so it's also nice to see that looking itself, in fact, influences, um, uh, influences the situation. See, now when we go there afterwards, we can have a few questions. So, so um, I, I, I don't think I should say so, too much about it now. I, I, um, yeah, let's go, let's go on. I, I want to keep the time. Another building in Iceland. I'll just go. That was very fast. Let's go with that. <laughs> no, because I want to go in another building in Denmark. See, circles. I just want to be respectful uh, for the time. Uh, so even though I could say a bit, um, And then this is a group of buildings which I just want to say a few, things around, uh, a few things about. But as you can see, there is a sort of a language in the various buildings. And, and uh, as, an, as an architecturally trained person can see, I'm not necessarily so interested in the finite architectural solutions, but more in the potential for allowing the user of the building or the visitor of the building to actually negotiate the quality of their own presence there. I don't just mean it from a pers sort of phenomenological perspective, but also for simply understanding to what extent does space or spatial opportunities like here actually allow us to, uh, to should, I, should I say, be more explorative. One could argue that, and this is a bit of a simplification, one could argue that the traditional sort of hegemony of a box in architecture, like the centric perspective and the sort of regime of Panofsky and the whole history of classicism has organized our way of seeing things since the Renaissance. See, now there was a lot of history in, in like one sentence. But has organized our way of seeing space so that it is comfortably organized. So I, I realized, OK, corner line, floor, wall line, corner over there, line up there. No, so I know what is up and down and left and right. Right. I can't really tell what's north and south, but it also doesn't really matter in here. But to a large extent, I'm actually, OK, I don't need to constantly check if I'm here. Right? And this, I think, for a long time was considered productive. So we had Bauhaus, we had all these things. All that stuff about temporality and constantly having to renegotiate reality is just too much hard work. One could also argue from a spatial productive and a more sort of social inclusive argument, maybe it's actually healthy to constantly be reminded that you need to check, are we here? Is this real? Is our relationship synchronized with the times in which we live, or is it actually caught in Sweden some 50 years ago? 
You see, maybe there is a way to create a space in which we are constantly reminded that this space is sort of um, reacting to us. There's been a number of different attempts that goes well beyond uh, uh, sort of uh, phenomenology. One could say that uh, Jane Bennett's uh, vibrant matter offered an opportunity to suggest that everything's constantly vibrant. So we had the triple O, the ontology, what is it, the, the mad ontologists, I call them, but you know, the sort of um, Tim, oh, now I'm a little lost, Timothy, out of, um, out of, is that not Houston also? Okay, here we have ecology, professor, there we go. Timothy Morton, right? Timothy Morton uses this. But this idea that you are, in fact, constantly checking up with trajectories. So some of these spaces, the idea was to see if we could establish a spatial language. In this case, it's in collaboration with local Ethiopian craftsmen, um, all local different local entities, local architects, local things. So, so very sort of last, inter last thing. But the whole idea that sharing is a constant negotiation. It's a kind of parliamentarism that is an architectural agent, right? And that is why it has no vanishing points. It has no comfort zones to the extent of saying, okay, here you can relax. It is constantly an, an, an asking for your physical attention. Let's just leave it at that, right? That way. So let's go on. No, because I was just meeting with a, with a few architecture students before, and they were like so smart, I thought I should say something that uh, so, so this is a, these are models uh, from uh, models from uh, my studio called the model model room model table, and uh, in my studio, I work very much with with sort of uh, with my hands. These are actually uh, sort of shadow lines you can see on a grid. You see the closer to the spotlight they are smaller because and then they create this grid. The few of you who are, yeah, Vladimir, you might know this is the Amman lines where you shoot a light photon through a a grid, then you have the Amman line. So this, you know all about that, right? So anyway, so if you, it's funny, like if you make the lamp move, the grid further away from the lamp, shadow moves less, and the grid closer to the lamp moves a lot, right? Basic algebra, right? And that means that if you have a lamp in the center of a round room, you can have this kind of Amman lines moving, but the lines further from the light moves faster, and the lines closer to the lines go slower, means that the shadow seems to be three-dimensional, not because of the thickness of the line, but because the perceived movement, so the dimensionality is driven by temporality. And suddenly you're in a situation, what are the rules um, for a space, right? To give it over to time, and because the Amman lines is a space, is an all-space filling sim system that is based on pentagonal or quasi-crystalline progressions. Uh, that's a nice argument. So playing around in the studio, always good fun, doing silly things. I believe Caroline Jones was actually here. It's a, almost too silly for you, Caroline. You went all in. Thanks for that, well, Caroline. I just need to. Where's Caroline? Did you leave? Yeah. Oh, here you are. Oh, Caroline. Thank you for joining this one. Do you remember it? I do. Yeah. OK, another one. So we do a lot of, uh, and this is actually in the context of the university in Berlin. So we do a lot of experimentations. And the, as you can see, the lay, hanging out in circles has become a thing. And now we're just moving to the, now we're just moving towards the end here. Um, so I worked a bit with, um, I worked a bit with uh, the public space lately within the context of climate and uh, during the different climate events. And a slightly more activistic agenda, not necessarily in collaboration with the museum, here is Paris during the famous COP21 in Paris where the Paris Agreement was made. And this is just in London two, three, four months ago. What is that, in December? Uh, and, um, and, um, and to make a long story short, it's a nice opportunity to see if the public space can actually host an opportunity to get physical about something which is otherwise mediated to an extreme extent so that having a physical relationship with it is almost uh, increasingly difficult. So, so the idea is, of course, that people look at it and say, OK, yeah, I get that. I read about it in the paper all the time, know all about it. And we do know all about it. Everybody knows all about everything, right? But then you walk up to it, and then you look, and you see, the, OK, my, the, my god, this ice is, in fact, it's actually quite beautiful, first of all. It's like 
it's sort of stunning. And then you put your hand on it, go like, oh, it's really cold, which is sort of new. But it's just this interesting, the knowledge of the hand, like the knowledge of your presence is just different than reading and that the knowledge, the mediated knowledge of the brain. And then there's a whole sequence of events and, and, and things you can do. And, and, and if, you are, if you're actually not so stressed, you realize that the sound, the sort of popping is all the small bubbles in the eyes. And the bubbles, of course, are under a lot of pressure because the glacier has been pushing it down. So suddenly you hear, you hear like pop. And then you're like, oh, something just popped. And then you look and then you see all the bubbles. And then you realize, oh, in these bubbles, there's a 20,000 year old bit of air. And if you're spend a little more time, you realize if you find a pocket, because the air, that air is so cold, you find a little pocket in the ice, you can actually sniff into the pocket, and then you can smell the air 20,000 years ago. <laughs> it's very interesting. So you see how physical senses, ears, smelling, touching, and so on. So, so it is, I mean, now, of course, on the photos, it's spectacular, and St. Paul's in the background, and Lon, it's all very exciting, and so on. But, but honestly speaking, it is incredibly physical. And... For a lot of people, I would also argue an opportunity to emotionalize a narrative that is otherwise very data-driven, which is great. We need data, but we also need to combine data with our feelings, right? And in that sense, I've become more involved with uh, things that are sort of about, well, how do we feel about what we know, right? It's not just about, you know, uh, uh, turning knowledge into doing or turning thinking into doing. It's also about turning thinking into doing and finding out how do we feel about it at the same time. Because having an emotional narrative is more likely to inspire us acting upon it than just knowing about it. This is a project related to migrants and refugees. Uh, it was in, in Venice. Uh, it's called the Green Light Project. It was actually also in Houston at the, at the, at the um, University in Houston. Um, that's a bit unfair that I can't recall. Rice, thank you so much, yes. And, um, and, um, and it's been traveling around. It's a workshop format where, people, where the notion of collaboration and shared learning, where the participants, in this case Syrian and Afghan refugees, are in fact both teachers and students. Some controversy with regards to the fact that in Venice particular, the participants were exposed to the visitor, which introduced a complex uh, problem. But I thought this sort of uh, stability of the cultural sector would allow for the civic forum for actually having the exposure not being a, a, a sort of alienating one, uh, which in, 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 to some extent I probably was wrong about, but nevertheless I'm so confident about the robustness of the cultural sector that it can take a bit of bashing from, from unhappy people, especially academically uh, trained people and so on. But nevertheless, uh, it's, it's a thing that I've been very interested in and uh, and this brings me to the last topic. Because I spoke so much about it last time, I won't, I won't bore you with it uh, too much this time. Um, but, but I have actually here in my pocket um, something. And before we go over, because this somehow has a little bit to do with the project over there. As you can see, um, this is a little object here, a small little lantern, in fact. And uh, I charged it in Berlin a few weeks ago. So this is how the sun looks in Berlin. And the charging station is here. It's a solar panel photovoltaic panel and a little, a little uh, rechargeable battery on the inside. Um, the point here is, is obviously uh, within a sort of a social economic model, uh, whether philanthropic or, or market driven, to, 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 depending on how we succeed, we're both a foundation and a social business. But the idea is to see if we could drive energy, a sustainable energy, into areas where there's no access to energy. And of course, the idea is here that that not only does that have a major impact uh, locally, but also, of course, that understanding what energy does in the sort of sequence of a life and education, whether you have your store open or you just want to have light in your home instead of having a fire on the floor. Uh, in that sense, I think it's a, it's, a, it's a project that for me has a lot of things to do with what I learned from the art world and how I could see if I could actually utilitarize or almost apply some of these ideas these artistic ideas onto something which is outside of the comfort zone of the art world. Because I've gradually be become increasingly in understanding that the art world is, as much as I talk about the cultural sector being a very sort of significant part of the civic society, the art world is, by all means, also often a very elitist and closed and self-obsessed uh, place. It's a closed circuit, especially if we go into the part of the art world, which is also called the art market, then, of course, it becomes incredibly elitist. But nevertheless, uh, um, this has been a project for me which I 
been enjoying a lot. And obviously, uh, one of the great things I learned was to actually have spent some time here at MIT, both with with the technology and engineering, and also with the Sloan School of Economics, and exploring the different things. So, so there was a lot of learning in this that actually came uh, from uh, uh, MIT during uh, the time that I got to spend here from the McDermott uh, Prize and all of that. Obviously, I could not uh, ask you uh, to uh, tell you, and so go and find this on the homepage called littlesun.com, and then you put it on your social media and spread it, and then people buy more of them, and then we get more money to drive the lamps into the hands of the people who are, in fact, uh, uh, actually happy to use it. Just as an ending note, because I normally talk about this as kind of you know, an opportunity to also emotionalize and make explicit something which is very hard to make tangible energy. Uh, this, uh, this actually also have a quite significant impact because not having to buy petroleum for a household which has uh, uh, limited resources, this is of course also an opportunity to uh, save money which then could go to something else. And as we are about to pass the one million lamps, uh, now being almost eight, seven, eight years old, uh, pass, we, are, we are slowly, pass, we're not quite there, so, so a little push, uh, it's like with Bernie Sanders, a little push, then there's a million. Uh, anyway, we are this year, I think, going to hit a million. But that just means, so if you think about this saving a family $1 a week, and now in the best world, if they were all on and, and, and so on and so forth, that's like a million dollar a week, right? That's like 50 million a year. And if the lifespan is five years, that's like 50, it's like 250 million, which would otherwise have gone to petroleum. Do you see? So, so it's not just that one dollar for the family. It's the kind of odd crowdsourcing way of taking two hundred and fifty million dollar worth of petroleum out of the eco economy of fossil fuels. Right. So there is a kind of a reversed opportunity in this, which has to do with a very decentralized, like idea, and so on and so forth. This is, uh, of course, a whole talk and and so on uh, by in it by by itself. Um, I just wanted to end it here because as we are looking at somewhat solar related and the ice and melting and so sustainability uh, questions. So I thought this was sort of a nice thing to end. So I passed the, uh, the clock a tiny bit. Um, Paul, uh, are you going to be taking over after me? So I thank you all for uh, staying put. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank, thank you, Paul. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Paul, for giving us such a powerful and thoughtful piece. And the idea now is to go with uh, Vladimir Bolovic, uh, the director of uh, MIT Nano, to Building 12 with Olafur to experience Northwest Passage. Thank you all for coming. Thank you.